The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice Tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMDs, Alpha, Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now, advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too. And there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello, and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and this week we're diving into one of our new Advice Tech sequel episodes. Yes, we're now a franchise, folks. We've got sequels, uh, just like Marvel, right? We're exactly like Marvel. Um, these sequel episodes where we bring back a previous guest on the show to get an update on any new features and enhancements and all the other exciting things they've been up to since we last heard from them. Now, here today to keep us up to date on all things Product Rex is the founder himself. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Nick Topham. Woo! G'day. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. It's been a year. Can't believe it. It has been. You joined us back on episode seven, and this is number 56. <laughs> there you go. So, Chi-Chi's and Crikey's, folks. <laughs> I can't believe that they've let me talk for this long. <laughs> oh, well, hopefully we'll be at 106 next time. Exactly. Exactly. Now, before we dive in, let's get to know you a little bit better again through your use of technology, and we couldn't possibly use the same questions again. We've got to make it a bit different. AI is the thing everybody's talking about. You know, if someone came to you and said, Nick, I'm going to build you your perfect AI buddy, it's designed just for you, what task would you want it to magically do for you? I think, look, I should have looked this up before we started. It might already exist, but <laughs> but <laughs> it probably does. But what really annoys me is is if I have to buy something online and I don't buy a lot and it's just a common product and it's stocked by multiple people, I just want to be able to type it in and someone just give me the cheapest one with the cheapest shipping. I it can't be that hard. Surely it exists. I don't know, but it just yeah. it frustrates me a lot. Not with the combo with shipping, right? Yes, it's the That's shipping because I live in a regional area, right? So there's yeah. big differences in shipping between places. So if it wasn't Sydney, yeah. it'd probably be pretty straightforward. But look. You'd, look, you'd think, but I'm not so convinced it is, to be honest. Um, <laughs> hence not. why I'm so addicted to Amazon Prime. Because that yeah. takes a whole lot of steps out of the process, which I'm not a fan of generally because I prefer to, you know, back the little guy. But sometimes <laughs> you just want the person that's got a massive logistics chain. <laughs> Consistent, right? It's the consistency. Yes. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> now, we know that all, you know, new tech isn't good tech necessarily, right? Some things are better analog. Is there some version of al- analog technology you prefer to the modern version? I don't know if it's analog technology, and I'm probably not alone in this, but I really don't like cars beeping at me. Um, right. So it's a bit of a, I don't know, it's not really technically analog and digital, but just I just want to be able to drive a car along without it beeping at me or telling me things. You know, that's. <laughs> I, just, it, it just, I don't I just, need a car that talks. I don't. Really? It's it really. <laughs> Not even the talking. It's just the beeping and, and it's just I don't like it. So Does that's it feel my, judgmental or just irritating? It's just irritating. Yeah. I just want to drive. I don't I don't need it to tell me tell me things and beep at me. So look, I'm with yeah. you. And it's like um I mean the GPS stuff cracks me up. I now use Google Maps um just because they think they keep it up more up to date. Except in Sydney they've put in loads of freeways recently and tunnels that are all sort of coming up online quite quickly and 
Google Maps does not know what to do with that. No. Like it's sending you all over the place. Yeah. Uh, so it makes it a bit exciting with directions. All right. <clears throat> Let's dive in to what's going on with Product Rex, shall we? So for those of you who aren't aware, I'm hoping you are, but if you aren't aware, can you just give us that sort of highlight on where you guys sit in the advice tech space and what the, you know, what the tool gets compared against or what sort of category it's in, just so that we can cover that off. Absolutely. Absolutely. So look, basically product tracks is, is essentially a product um, research and recommendation tool. When we talk about product, we're talking about um, investment products, you know, at a, at a platform level, at an investment level and at a, an SMA level, which I guess is somewhere in between. So, you know, what that looks like is when you're an advisor and you've got a, a new client or an existing client and you need to find out more about their investment products, their super or whatever they've got, you come and you use product tricks, you know. So we're talking about things, you know, primarily things like fees and asset allocation. We do a little bit of work on product features. We've got some interesting stuff around um, subjective opinions on platforms that advisors can put into the system kind of um, – uh, structure that but really yep. it's all about those product recommendations and obviously getting that then through to the ad- potentially through to the advice piece um so awesome. that's kind of the, the the part of the market we sit in now we had a great conversation so but like we were saying back in episode seven so listener if you really aren't across um the detail and the background of product recs i'd encourage you to go back and listen to episode seven nick and i really went through a whole lot of the detail because what we're going to go from here on is new stuff and updates since then so i'm sure there's actually i'm aware that there's been some significant projects so let's cover the big stuff first what are some significant things that have changed for products product recs recently i mean i know one of the ones was some scenario structures that you put in place yeah yeah it's it's funny since our last one you know the the first that wasn't even our first year the la- the year we kind of talked about last year was a whole lot of us uh, not smaller projects but uh, you know add-ons or enhancements to what right. we already got and this year's all been about basically new big stuff so um you know like you like you mentioned what we had it was called the, the basically the families and clients review so essentially i looked at the entire structure of product tracks and you know when you when you go through product tracks and this might be difficult for a non-user to imagine you know essentially we talk about scenarios so you yeah. you you've got a client they might do a rollover and move some money around or pension or whatever so that's we called that a scenario and you'd have in product recs, you know, all these different scenarios if you're a user over time that you've done. Yeah. Now, what I felt was kind of missing is if you had, you know, John Smith who's doing a scenario and his wife, Jane Smith, right? We didn't really have a great way to structure, to, to kind of group all of John's scenarios together and to actually link them to Jane, you know, or the rest right. of the Smith family. So, essentially, that's what we've implemented. It's kind of like a very light CRM kind of functionality. Sure. Um, but especially for those longer term users, we're looking at you know a couple of hundred scenarios in there over the the two years we've been running, or a few hundred. Um, it just makes things much much cleaner, and it actually leads the way for some big kind of enhancements we've got coming up in the next you know twelve months or so. Awesome, and you know for us, and and look, it's so funny when you <clears throat> having been on this journey like with you guys from fairly early on, I guess, is that's actually the thing we were hitting is we're now into our second go at clients yeah. for this because we've come up to review time, right? And so so we we had done the thing that everybody does, which gets a you know, get a bit anal about the way you name scenarios just so we could yeah. be clever and everything. But you know, it's great to have as you guys evolve and we're all sort of, you know, getting a bit more embedded with the tool and it's great yep. to have these things that just make it a bit more organized. Yeah. And it's just it, it was just you know, and there's nothing wrong with the right, the structure of just having individual scenarios. I told no. people, like, keep, if you like it, keep doing it, you know. Yeah. But it's like you said, it's about just trying to have a bit of a standard structure and just trying to make, you know, the whole point is hitting hitting pain points as users. That's always been the our approach. You know, what are people struggling with? How can we resolve that? Those are always yeah. the questions we ask. And that was yeah. that was one of the things that came up, you know. And certainly one of the things that um, those sort of features help with is, look, lots of these tools I think – <clears throat> advisors say some advisors will only use themselves. You know, they sort of it's it's just to them. Whereas, oh, you know, I'm a big fan of using as much of the back office as we can. So they'll set the new scenario up, get some data in, and then of course the advisor or the power planner or whoever might go in and and actually take a good look. But the more you can do that, the better. And therefore, the more structure and the more obvious what things are and what the historical ones are. But this is new. All those sort of things help with handover. 
yes. you know, really clean handover. Yes. If you don't have that, it can get pretty messy. <laughs> yeah, and that kind of ties in with one of the other tools. You know, exactly what you said ties in with one of the other tools we we came up with, which was sandbox mode. It was uh, it was last year, late last year, we brought that in. But basically, that's all about the same kind of thing. You know, that handover. You've got your someone might come in and pump in all your initial data or import it from another software or another platform, and sandbox mode basically lets you go in and kind of play around with your actual recommendations and it's just you know again it's just trying to respond to those user demands they they said you know we want to review accounts that we've already got Can we make it easier so that's sandbox mode that was another big enhancement yeah okay exciting are there any other those sort of chunkier ones in the last 12 months yeah i mean i think another another big one was um when we brought in uh, what we call bulk importing or bulk actions so that's kind of no one else really does that in the market uh, except us. But basically, the idea was, you know, maybe you've got 20 clients to review on a particular platform or maybe you buy a book or maybe you just want to do a whole lot at once. And basically, what that will let you do is import a whole lot of scenarios at once, right? So, you can import 10, 20, 100 scenarios if you like, right? Let's say they're all in platform A, okay? And mm. new platform that's come out, platform B, and you want to see the price difference between A and B for these scenarios. So you can basically go through, import, you know, 50 clients in platform A, click a button that says, what if they're in platform B? And it will do a bulk, basically a bulk price comparison for you, um, which is really, really powerful um, when you're making those kind of macro decisions. So you're not just kind of going through one by one because that's nightmare. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely it is. And it's... um. Look, I'm I'm actually curious, and this is just off the top of my head. I had to put you on the spot, but it must be challenging for you guys as much as it is for us with all of the oh, we've upgraded the product to this new thing, and we've just moved everybody across. Oh, we've combined this with the other one, and everybody's consult. Like that must be as much as of a disaster for you as it is us, right? Because far out, that's hard to keep track of. Yeah, it's look, it, it's funny as as we've evolved, it's. I, I don't know if platforms have gotten better at communicating with us or we're just on the radar, but we're lucky enough to have those contacts at platforms now. It probably does help a bit. Awesome. But yeah, I mean, it all comes back to our initial data collection. You know, we, we collect all of our own data except except managed funds, um, but all the platform level data, you know, it's all automated. We check it regularly. It's not just like 20 people sitting in a room. It's all all automation. Yeah. Um, so when those things change, it's much, much easier for us to pick it up and obviously then deal with it. Yeah. Perfect, because it is. It's just so frustrating, and and you know, it's if you're dealing with one major platform, maybe you know, once in a while, that's traumatic. But you only need to have a few across your clients, and it just seems relentless. It's like they're all just playing, you know, dance musical chairs. You know, yeah. <laughs> Gosh, what are you all up to? Especially at the moment, you know, we've got right. obviously the launch of Edge. We've got changes to to NetWealth Core, and we've got um, changes to to My North as well. All happening yes. at the same time. There's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of things happening for advisors, and thankfully, we're kind of able to give them a pretty quick answer to a lot of their questions on what's what's happening. You know, perfect, yeah. perfect. What about any other sort of tweaks or adjustments you've sort of made over time? Is there other things that you I and mean, maybe they were you know feedback from users or anything like that that sort of come you know over the last little while that you sort of upgraded the system for? Yeah, I mean, it's always there's always things happening. You know, we're never just sitting there. You know, twiddling your thumbs, I don't know, no? twiddling our thumbs. There's always there's always things happening. You know, there's little things like we're adding, you know, cash minimums and alerts for that and the abilities to, you know, what someone came to me once and they said, Oh, look, when our clients come in for a view, we don't really change the portfolio much. We just reduce the cash or or to, to the minimum. And I don't know. We don't really have a function for that. So, you know, it's little things like that. It's like one button, but you're saving a lot of time. And yeah. obviously, that's applicable across a lot of users. You know, we're talking about like, you know, if, if, if they're going through and making a recommendation, they drop an investment in and it's not available on platform, telling them it's not available. What do you want to do about it? You know, just those yeah. little things. They're all just, you know, ease of use enhancements. And they're just relatively easy to code most of the time, but immediately kind of add value and can help people out. Awesome. And what about, um, I mean, you've now had a bit longer to see how people are using it and I'm sure you're, you know, getting feedback and, and questions and like you say, requests from the users. Is there something you've seen that, you know, a practice has just done something that really blew you away? Like I can't believe that this is the way you're using it or this is the way you're implementing the tool? Yeah, sometimes it's 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 um it's funny. You know, we talked, I think we talked last time about what was a new feature then, Autorex, which is like the ability to bulk add platforms and, and model portfolios. So it's, it's a- yeah. And I think you use it as well. So it's it's yeah, a it's do. a 
it's a really easy way to to kind of bulk out all that stuff. But before we had that, people had their own kind of ad hoc ways of doing that. It's the same with rebalances, you know. People have like ad hoc or interesting ways of doing things and then we always think, well, that's, you know, quite good and basically try to to riff off, riff, not rip, riff off that <laughs> to kind of make automated functions to support that. So those right. are kind of the ones that spring to mind. But there's always interesting things that people are doing that we try and um, – try and support where we feel they can add value across the whole user base. And I guess that's the other thing that, look, we're starting to see too is, um, <laughs> is you know, there's been a lot of work on, say, advice production, right? And I guess you guys are sort of firmly in that category of, of pulling it together and doing the research. But um, to date, and I guess CFS Edge is one of those things that's part of this sort of um, focus is, you know, the whole implementation side of things has been fairly unloved, you know, yeah. for some time. Um, and so even for me, you know, I can see place, you know, times when we might have done some analysis, there's been a, a switch recommendation or something like that, and it goes to the implementation team. But of course, things have moved in that time, even if it's only a day or two. Um, and so it's, you know, thinking of ways that we can just make it so streamlined across the whole team, you know, so that everybody can just step up without any tweaking, without any, without as much sort of individual applied nows, only when it's necessary, yeah. you know, particularly for calculated things. Yeah. You know, a lot of this stuff are calculations, you know. Um, human beings shouldn't be doing those. No. <laughs> it should be tech, you know, no. for sure. And it's, yeah, it's funny that the kind of, um, I don't know what you call, call it, but basically, like you say, bringing through research and recommendations through to the actual implementation phase. It's something we've looked at. The technology for the, the, the kind of products that we need to implement it for is sometimes a little... Uh, not lacking. It's sometimes a little protected or a little bit, yes. you use the word now, you know, a little bit yeah. uh, esoteric in, in how it works. So yeah. that's, I guess, a bit of a stumbling block for us. I think that's going to improve. Um, certainly a lot of the platforms are signaling they're going to improve that area. It is something yeah. we're going to definitely um, definitely look at in the future. Um, yeah. Hopefully as advice gets easier to implement following QAR and all that sort of stuff, you know. so. Well, and I think particularly when we can separate, if we separate, you know, establishment type of advice versus reviews or, or, or adjustments, you know, yes. once somebody's in a platform, then it sort of feels like it would make sense to, to be able to stream some, streamline yes. some of that comms through, you know, like it's, and from their end, surely, you know, they'd love it. I'm sure they've got a team that are just like far out. There's a lot to process here. Yeah. Um, yeah. So look, it'll be interesting to see. I'm really curious. You know, we're not exactly fast moving in financial services. So no, we'll but we are, we it, look, yeah, it's, we're keeping an eye on it. It's, um, you know, from a technological, from our point of view, it's not terribly complex from the platforms. I understand it is probably quite complex, um, yeah. but yeah, it, it will be interesting to see how it evolves. Awesome. Now, you've clearly been pretty busy, so you probably need a little lie down, but um, <laughs> what other challenges are your sort of users facing? You know, what have you got on the future sort of wish list or things that are coming down the track? Yeah, it's it's an interesting question. Something I'm working on actually right now um, around uh, SMAs, actually. Um, yep. So, I don't know if you, you've probably certainly seen popular. it. We've certainly seen a huge growth in SMAs mm. um, in the last probably, uh, you know, 36, 24 months. Um, and then more recently in the last kind of 18, 12 months with, with what we call what I call white label SMAs. So, you yep. know, practices have their own private SMAs. Um, big, big growth in them as well. There's basically no tools out there to support them um, at the moment, uh, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're looking to basically expand our ability to kind of support those SMAs, both the what I call the kind of the professional ones and the white label ones. Yeah. Um, so that's that's on the immediate uh, radar for the future. I'm, I'm literally coding it right now, but I, I think that's a big area of growth and it's a pain point and. Um, yeah, it's it's on yeah, the immediate okay. radar. That'll almost certainly be our next major release is some work in that area. Yeah, okay. Fantastic. Anything else further? What how about integrations? Where are you guys at with integrations? Yeah, look, integrations is a good one too. Um so, you know, we've got all the platforms. Um recently just just put on CFS Edge and our platform uh a platform integrations. I say all the platforms, all the kind of major rap platforms. Yeah. So they're all kind of ticked off. We did them, you know, ages ago. Um, but recently put on software integration. So we brought on um, IntelliFlow and Dash, um, which are all, which obviously, uh, you know, IntelliFlow is coming up in Australia. Dash, mm -hmm. um, quite a popular 
tool as well now. Yep. Um, so we got integrations with those guys, but you know the kind of push pull integrations. Always looking to expand our software integrations too, because um, there's a lot of new players coming up, um, and you know the what we do. Obviously, we have the the big advantage in that. It's very accessible for users. You know, we don't have a membership fee or anything like that. They just come in, create an account, and away they go. So that's mm-hmm. good for them. Um, and our open API is very, very easy to use. So, yeah, the software integrations is more of a focus at the moment than platform, just because we've got all the platforms basically. Yeah, okay. And is it fair to say, I mean, well, look, software providers, well, as you would know, I've always got a long list of things to do, right? So there's always a lot of yes. demands and upgrades and things like that. But I'm assuming that their um, understanding or ab- ability to make decisions on an integration um, is going to be smoother than a platform merely because, you know, one's in the game and one's not. So so and I'm imagining for the big platforms there's all of those layers of people you've got yeah. to get through as well, which must be a bit of a challenge. Well, yeah, and the, the interesting thing is especially with the platform integrations is is it that's more like we do most of the work for the platform integrations right you know like almost all of it um whereas the software integrations it's usually on the opposite you know this one that we just did with with dash really really compre- co- comprehensive i was trying to say really really comprehensive in what they've done in terms of bringing data backwards and forwards and they did 95 percent of it because okay. we've already got the open apis there you know it's basically we just say here's how to access this here's how to read it here's our flows um so that makes it um you know the imperative if they want to get the integration going and they've got the, the staff they can just get stuck in you know yeah okay awesome and look there are going to be more i remember um yeah, some while back clayton actually said to me oh Peter, do you think there's going to be enough um tech to interview for the advice tech podcast to continue oh. and which cracks me up because like you're only the second person we've had back for a second time and that was a year ago um and there's just more and more and more which sort of surprises me to be honest because there's not that many of us as advisors so no it's not a massive market um but there just seems to be more and more tech yeah you know yeah. it's it's crazy crazy stuff um and is there any is there any plans in the future so you've got that sort of like bigger tech you know so dash and IntelliFlow absolutely fall into those sort of bigger tools that are multi layered for a practice is there anybody else that's on the on the um radar things like that maybe are doing a similar comparison as you are but say on you know, ESG or things like that, you know, so you might be able to work alongside somebody looking at a portfolio and it might also then, you know, be able to feed through and say, well, hey, actually, based on the client's values, that's got, you know, these challenges. Is there any anything like that you're looking at? Um, look, there's a few out there. Um, it's, um, it, it's, it's difficult. I, I don't, I don't really keep as better, a good a track as I should of, of the other software providers and the new ones that, that come out there. Um, yeah. But uh, it's probably yeah. down to your users, right? So, hey, listeners, yeah. <laughs> if there's something you think would be great, you just need to to send Nick that email. Yeah, and go, like we <laughs> we certainly tried to to bring that um, ESG specifically. We tried to bring that ESG capability in with a couple of different providers. It's always it's always yeah. challenging with the smaller teams to get the pr- development resources on their side of things. Yeah. You know, both in Teleflow and Dash are not. They're not small players anymore. They've got no. resources. You know, they've yeah. got these development hours. That's always a contributing factor. Yeah. Um, but you know, in the end, we've got that open API. It is available. So when they do have those resources, they can just jump in. There's really no work for me to do in yeah. that side of things. Yeah, so, awesome, awesome. Yeah. Now, yeah, everybody talks about AI, and there's mm. all sorts of uses for it. I'm, I'm becoming a bit. I mean, I'm struggling to have an original thought on marketing stuff without using ChatGPT <laughs> now, right? So it's like, oh, I'll just ask it first and then I'll go from there. So my whole yeah. brain is like rewired for that. But is there any role, do you think, for any – and of course it won't be necessarily ChatGPT, but any role for AI you see playing in product recs down the track? Um, is it, do you see that happening at all? It's funny. You, you, I saw, you know, it, it's funny you ask that question because obviously when I start a product rex, you know, this is – you know, June 2021, right? AI was not people. You know, think I'm lying. AI was not on the radar no, in terms in terms of chatbots, which is kind of what we talk about when we talk about AI, right? Yeah. You know, Chat GPT four and all those sorts of things. I mean, we talk about yeah. AI. It's it's more really chatbots. Um, yeah. They weren't on the radar. They 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 kind of existed. You know, you had like Jasper, but it wasn't really 
as loose as the chat GPT is now, chat GPT-4. Yeah. Um, so can it play a role? Yes. However, when Product Rex launched, I developed it basically to avoid <laughs> avoid the role that chat that, that chatbots fill because they weren't really developed. And I was like, oh, I don't really yeah. want to have to try and stuff around with it. Yeah. So could it? Possibly. It really um it really depends on where we where which direction we take the tool in the future. You know, we deliberately kind of avoided things like long, long narrative, um, which is yep. perfect for what chatbots can do. Yep. Um, you know, I see a lot of tools coming out now which say they've got, you know, this uh, you know, they're an AI tool or whatever it may be. I mean, I think ninety percent of them are just chat just using a chat GPT for a wrapper, you know, yeah. which is but you know, it, it's available. It seems pretty straightforward to use, so we may look to utilize that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, so a long way of saying I be, don't know. <laughs> yeah, it, and it may even be not the core. So, you know, because I, I, I think for right at the moment the AI tools that, that are intuitive or you can use quickly, like you say, are these conversational things, but also um, they're not for deeply technical things. No. Right. So generally you're not using them for something deeply technical, but where I have seen that apply is when it's at something in parallel. So, okay, you've done the analysis, you've done the work in, in product recs, and maybe the AI is coming up with a whole lot of cool graphical ways you could represent that. Or do you mean like it's the, it's the adjunct rather than the core? Yeah. Um, you, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, I think the kind of, the, the, the thing you have to keep in mind is that there's no objectivity with these tools right yeah. it's if if you if it if it reads data that says one plus one is four then one plus one is four right Correct. so it's it just has to be very careful i think with how it's utilized um, yeah i'm not again not ruling out i personally would like to explore it in the future um it's just kind of thinking about how that will fit in and fit in well you know and is there any other sort of um, technology sort of headwinds you're seeing or even maybe seeing from the requests you're getting, you know, things that, that advice practices are either asking for more or facing, you know, frequently as challenges? Is there anything that's popped up that sort of you're like, oh, okay, that's a bit different or that's a new one that they're facing? Yeah, again, I think the SMA, the SMAs are a real the – uh, they're a pain point at the moment. They're, they're very, yeah. very popular. You know, um, there's basically – limited tools to deal with them we're in a really good space to deal with them because people are using it i mean we can handle smas at the moment without any yeah. issue um but i'm talking about more about building them out and showing that right. next level of data right if yeah. you've got a custom sma and you want to use product tricks you can handle it with zero issues in product tricks. very very easy but it's yeah. about having that additional level of functionality to do some really interesting things and some some cool things and, and make it a lot easier for them to do things like reporting um, so i think that's definitely a uh, something that's still on the radar yep. um, that we're going to be that we're going to be looking at for sure. Cool, cool. And anything, um, you know, anything that you, else that you guys are being involved in, anything that you're seeing out there that adds value to advisors or or things you're seeing down the track, um, you know, as you interact with all these different platforms and and providers. Uh, that's a that's a difficult question, isn't it? <laughs> um, things that are adding value to advisors at the moment. It's again, I I because I'm not an advisor, I don't. I don't come at things with an advisor's perspective. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And when I talk to advisors, it's typically just about product tricks <laughs> rather than about rather than about the, the the market as a whole. So I'm not really sure I can answer that one. I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. I know that's a bad. Not answer, at all. No, 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 truth, not at all. You know? I am curious though if there's any. So outside of advice, just you know, as a business owner, really, or as an as an individual, is there any tech you've come across that caught your eye, like something like? Oh, that looks cool or that, you know, that saved you some time or or that you've sort of changed changed the way you've operated? Uh, let me have a think. I mean, I don't I, I know I, I should have I should have a good answer for this question, but I, I, I don't. <laughs> well, maybe not. I mean, maybe what you're saying is you've really um, streamlined what you use well, on I a day to day basis. I mean, basis. the obvious answer is is in the chatbots and in, and in things like ChatGPT. Yeah. But I guess that's the standard answer. I don't want to give the standard answer, but obviously, using things like that is is hugely powerful. And I mean, I use it a lot for 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 writing text or writing um, uh, uh, mostly text, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, a little bit of analysis and that sort of stuff and testing out, seeing what that can do. Yeah. Um, but I guess that's that's the big one for me in the last 12 months and probably that's the same with everyone. But, Which um, is funny, truth, I think, you know? as you, to your point, you know, even when we were talking the first time, you know, back a year ago, then it just wasn't anywhere near the radar. No, Whereas it now no. it's just, so for some of us, it's just become, well, why wouldn't I at least start there? You know, and I think that's that's probably where I've seen advisors and, hey, listeners, if you haven't sort of gone down this path, 
honestly, I think you need to just start digging around. Um, there's loads of LinkedIn posts on ideas of how to use ChatGPT for all sorts of ways, but you know, writing text, writing, I mean, even, you know, if you've got something that's a summary on the markets, it's something you've written, push it in and ask it to, you know, revamp it and turn it into, I don't know, you know, bullet points or turn it into, like, just ask it to do something different and see what comes out. Yeah. Um, Because it's, it's certainly, it certainly challenged my thinking on a number, not the way, not the answer, it challenged me on the way I presented it. Yeah, the yeah. language. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I find it really powerful for headlines, you know, like you need a, a name of a webinar or a headline for an article or, you know, that sort of stuff, which you can just spend hours navel-gazing yeah. on that stuff. I don't know about you, but I just find that really hard. So, <laughs> Yeah. In, yeah. It, you're absolutely right. And it's the, the little things like that which drive, you know, it's like I used it for um, uh, choosing – I hate using icons and graphics for when I'm doing things. So right. I, I used it for that, which I thought was extremely useful. I was like, here's what this is supposed to do. Give me some icons of this icon set we use. And it did. So I, I was, I was yeah. very happy with that. But, you know, it's, um, I, I think that's the answer, the, the kind of the flavor of the, the flavor of the year is, and it's the, you know, it's the truth. Yeah. I don't have absolutely. anything more, uh, Interesting than that, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, you're you're busy dealing with all of our upgrades that we're requesting, That's it. right? That's it. You just yeah. head down, bum <laughs> up. Is there anything we've missed in terms of updates or things that, that um you know have either been happening or coming down the track for product recs? Nothing I can talk about. You know, it's all it's all no, secret it's like stuff. there's nothing really secret to be honest with you. <laughs> it's it's you know, but um. You know, it'll be interesting. I think we didn't really touch on it. It'd be interesting to see what what happens with the QAR. It looks like we're not, you know, we're probably realistically uh, probably 12 months off any legislative changes. Yeah. Um, but it's going to be interesting what happens to that. I think we're going to get a, a kind of a, a solid draft early next year. That's probably going to change directions for a lot of software providers, probably including product tricks. So yep. um, I, I think everyone will be interested to see what happens there because basically what I think the writing is on the wall, people deny it, the writing is on the wall for the SOA and I think we're going to see a very, very reduced format document, like, you know, two, three, four pages realistically. And I think, you know, for me, and this could just be my approach as a business owner, right, because we're all have to going to come at this from what while there'll be our dealer groups or whatever having having um things that will be told we need to do, I still think we'd each need to come at it, come at it from a risk assessment. And to me – I think really the SOA had become an evidential, like evidence of our thinking. And that's not going to change in that we're still going to need to be able to do that. You know, provide why did you come up with that? How did you come up with it? What's your just, you know, that sort of stuff. So it's sort of, to me, is just sort of shifted it behind the curtain. So, so there's still a whole lot of work that's going to have to happen and all that sort of stuff. It just might not need to be in one word document. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You're absolutely yeah. right. You know, you're not saying you're going to do whatever you want, just wing no. it, you know. No. It's just going to, you know, reduce the actual formal preparation, which Correct. I think is, uh, you Correct. know, we looked at some data. For, and again, I, I hate to go off on a tangent. We looked at some data from, from Product Rex and we're looking at, I think, I hope I don't quote the data wrong, but I think we're looking at 60 to 90 days from the time um, where they basically get finalized their recommendations in product recs to when they actually implement the advice. That's okay. the lag. So that was based on a, a, some, some data we pulled out. But, you know, if we can reduce that, then obviously it's going to be better for everyone. And it's kind of Absolutely. ties back to what you said earlier where you've got the data in and by the time it gets to the implementation teams, they have to kind of massage it. So Yeah. And I do think um, what will be interesting is is I heard somebody say, oh, but it's, you know, I know we've got to do the the evidence, but, you know, it'll be it'll be so much better. We can just sort of knock things, you know, pull it together and get moving. And I'm like, well, the thing is when it's behind, when you're not forced to go through a framework that's a document like the SOA, then you're going to have to have your internal framework. Like you're going to have to have something that says, this is how we save this thing. This is how we save it out of product risk. This is how we do you know I mean, like you're going to have to have that structure. So I don't know that the, that the responsibility changes. It's just that it lets us be a bit freer about those choices we make. You know, we're not being told the document We're like we need to make those choices, which I love, you know, because um, that's where you can get more efficiencies. But I do think we all need to acknowledge it's going to mean we're actually going to have to make some calls about the way we do that stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, the alternative is you can keep writing 100-page SOAs if you really yeah. want. I'm sure they're oh, not going to prevent you from writing an SOA, <laughs> but it's not going to be in your best interest, is it? Or your clients, I'd argue. Or your clients, for that matter, yeah. I know. Yeah, heavens to Murgatroyd. All right. Uh, 
Well, we covered QIR too. Hey, we're hitting all the high points here. All right, Advice Explorers, if you'd like to find out more about Product Rex, then you can actually register for free via the link in the episode show notes. We've also included Nick's LinkedIn details, and I'd encourage you to follow him because he does do uh, LinkedIn videos and, and posts about the latest updates. So that'll be a way to sort of keep on top of what's going on. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Nick, Thank and you. for keeping this awesome tool running and making our lives easier as advisors. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure. So, I'm betting some of you listening are actual users of of Product Rex. Um, Nick Off Air actually shared with me that uh, they've hit 2,809 users, which out of whatever the figure of of current advisors uh, left in financial advice in Australia, it's a pretty pretty decent percentage for something not that old. Um, and kudos to Nick and the team for, for getting that traction. But I guess, you know, if you really have found that the tool works well for you, that's something that, you know, we'd love you to share on the Ensemble Community Platform. People need to hear about these tools, why they work, why it works for you. Um, any insight like that can save people a huge amount of time. You know, we do these episodes to sort of give you that sneak peek um, as a first step. But, you know, second step is, hey, reach out on the platform and go, look, anybody else out there using it, what do you reckon? I've currently got these other tools I use that it needs to be used in conjunction with. What are the challenges? What are the benefits? You know, make sure you take advantage of the rest of us on the Ensemble Community platform. So please get on there and get talking. Now, as for my thoughts, um, and I'm really glad that uh, Nick brought up the QAR and all, all the things are going to be coming up in the future because one of the things that's um, interesting to me about this is of absolutely this is going to change no matter what really happens. The intention is there's going to be a change in the way we communicate with the public, right, in terms of or our clients, um, in terms of advice. So that's clearly a change. But I think something that maybe hasn't really – been focused on as much is that when you don't have this massive encyclopedian size document that captures the advisor's thinking and the support and the background and the research and the forecast and whatever those things are, um, but you require them to be able to provide evidence of that should it be required down the track, then the you know we're still going to have to be doing all these things. Um, and what's interesting about that is there's going to need to be processes and procedures in place that are extra. I know it sounds like it'll be less, right? Because maybe, you know, there's not as much focus on this big giant SOA, but actually we're going to need to give some thought to um, the some structure to that sort of pre-SOA stage that we all do, which is the research and analysis and, and strategy consideration and all those steps. So, What's interesting is you don't need to wait to see what they're talking about to add, you know, to really add some value in your practice to that because any work you do on that step now will have benefit no matter what they come out with, right? Because it's a given. It's a given now that we do these things. So the sort of things you could be thinking about is really breaking down the analysis and research steps you go on, you know, go through, you know, breaking them all down and seriously considering you know, is there any that could be delegated to somebody else? Is there anything that could be done at a batch at the beginning of the month ready for for an advisor or a power planner to get to when they're ready? You know, really think about, you know, what could somebody else do three quarters of and then the advisor come in and, and finish it? Um, also consider, you know, you've probably got a lot of tech tools you're using for that particular stage. Are you using all of them to the full benefit that they provide? Most of us aren't right? Most of us aren't using all of them, all of the features. We're probably unaware of a whole lot of features. Make sure you know what those features are. Um, and then consider, okay, well, if the SOA is no longer, um, you know, providing almost that capture of a whole lot of the numbers and the outputs, then how else are we going to capture them and how else do we want to document that? You know, do the current tools have a way to create some PDFs or some other capture of that data that could be put on file against that client? You know, that then leads me down to another thought is, you know, do you, is it worth doing a bit of a revamp, a bit of a spring clean on the way you've set up the cl your cloud folders or however you capture, you know, files of clients, you know, so that would include 
um, the SOAs previously, but, it, you know, letters, anything that you've got there that's for the client, you know, really making sure that's super easy to follow and grab what you need because, you know, just going for the SOA is no longer be, going to be the deal, is it, right, when somebody's going through that stuff. So it's going to need to be really well structured, easy to, to follow, easy to pick things up. You know, the sort of things that that um, could be something we should all focus on is, you know, really getting tight on your naming convention um, for files. You know, we use a reverse date naming convention on documents at the beginning so that then they're always in order when you go and try and grab something. Um, so that is, you know, the, the year, 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 month, month, day, day dash, you know, and then whatever the name of the file is, that sort of thing. So that can tidy things up. You may even want to think about, you know, if you've got a a broad client folder or family folder, you know, how are you, what's your subfolder? You know, some people might start thinking about event-based ones because then you've got all of that research fault, you know, saved in that event-based folder um, rather than maybe SOAs in one place and other things in another place. So just have a think about making sure it's everything's really well saved, real well structured, um, because that's going to be required when you take away the framework that sort of enforces that structure on us. So I think there's probably an opportunity to get ahead of the game there. Don't worry about so much about what's going to come out. You know, the tea leaves aren't going to tell us it's just going to be what it's going to be, but there is some stuff that in the meantime, we could probably all focus on. And hey, if you've got some suggestions of how we could all do that better, please share. I would love to hear because I'm always looking for ways we can do things that are either more efficient or more organized or save my team time or just stop them feeling, you know, frustrated by something being a pain in the neck. So um, please share any ideas you have in that space. Now, as we all know, there's only one skill to become a bionic advisor and that skill is avid curiosity. And to help you build that habit, today's Curiosity Corner app that caught my eye is called Gametize. Now, you can find it at gametize.com. That's G-A-M-E-T-I-Z-E, clearly not English, uh, Australian English or, or English English. It's uh, clearly in the US. But Gametize is basically a simple gamification platform that you can use for community engage, engagement. So. It will motivate target behaviors for a variety of purposes. It could be employer training, it could be performance management, or it could be consumer marketing. So anyway, anybody can create pretty quickly, like broadly in minutes, certainly in an hour or so, can create a sort of white label web or mobile campaign or a game and taking advantage. They've got a whole lot of sort of gamification mechanics set up. It could be an interactive challenge. It could be um, a competition. It could be a social sort of competition or rewards, redemption, all that sort of stuff coupled with whatever your own sort of, you know, theme is. So whatever you want them to focus on. And, you know, these can be really fun. So there could be some fun social challenges. They could be answering trivia, posting a photo. You could have feedback loops. You might want to let people build up badges over time. They could even redeem prizes, you know, so they earn points and then redeem redeem a prize. And it could be, hey, lunch with the investment (laughs) guru. I don't know. I don't know whether that actually would be a great prize. But you know what I mean? You could actually have a whole point scheme that they could then redeem uh, in the reward stores. So, I can see this applying in any sort of environment where you want to sort of get over change management hurdles. Change management can apply to employees. So that could be even taking on new tech. You could gamify that and give them some things they've got to complete and they get points for doing sort of things and they can have a leaderboard and you know who in the team who's further ahead. You wouldn't believe how motivating that is for a lot of people. We've all been at conferences where somebody's already onto the app and trying to get all the points um, to win whatever the prize is for the app for the conference. So this is that type of thing, but a much much simpler. So certainly change management from an employee perspective, but think about you know change management for clients or a consumer. Is there a behavior you either want them to practice or learn or change over time? You know how can we gamify that? Right. So any behavior we need to see a shift in. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear what you come up with because I've taken an initial look at this and I think even if it's not this tool, things like this, we're going to be able to put in our tool belt uh, as another thing to help people make progress and help engage people with us in a far more fun way, right? And and gamifying is, things is something we all actually understand and, and engage with really well. Uh, there's loads of studies to prove that. Um, so check it out and let me know what you think. 
Welp, that's all we've got for this week. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast, as always, so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each week. Um, and if you've got an event coming up in the sort of next six to 12 months, I'm actually having some awesome conversations with groups um, looking to get a speaker on talking about even streamlining tech stats. Tech stacks, wow, that's hard to say. Streamlining tech stacks, um, you know, how they can almost get a bit of a minimalist approach to tech, you know, discovering what their next innovation opportunities are, even just energizing their teams, right? Everybody needs a bit of a wake up call, a bit of an energy boost. I'd be more than happy to tee up a time to have a chat, get a feel for your events. So, and we can brainstorm something that will suit you. So please reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's forward slash Peter M D P E I T A M D. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious.